Hello and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. I am Katie Helper, as you all probably know, and very excited to be here with you. Just adjusting my camera a little bit. Uh, we have a great show for you today. We have an interview that I did with Stefania Maurizzi, who is a very brave Italian journalist who worked on WikiLeaks. She has a book that she's written that uh, I highly recommend. Uh, it's called Secret Power. And uh, I talked to, to Stefania all about it all about working with Julian Assange, all about the trials and tribulations of working on that. She was uh, spied on by the CIA for doing that. And uh, it's a really great interview. But before that, I'm going to be bringing on a special guest to make an emergency update, to share an emergency update with us. But before we do that, I just want to say welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening, for coming. Please do like the stream if you haven't already. Just a thumbs up. That's a way to help the algorithm. You just do one thumbs up. Also, you can subscribe so you don't miss any streams. As Brad is saying right now, please remember to hit the like button, share button, and subscribe. It's a way to beat back the uh, corporate overlords who try to control our lives. What else can you do? You can support the show at Patreon, patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show for just uh, $1 a month. You just help make this show happen. It couldn't happen without that. And for $5 a month, you get great uh, exclusive content. So for this uh, episode, for instance, for this show, we have a uh, uh, Stefania Maurizzi. We have an extended interview with her where she goes through some detailed uh, investigative scoops and kind of behind the scenes stuff that she did with Assange. So that will be at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that is patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. You can also become YouTube members, and that is pretty cool. And you get um, little emojis, uh, Bodhi emojis and badges that say how long you've been a member. Someone in the comments says uh, the Patreon site won't comply with me. So Brad and Tyler, who helped make the show happen, let's... We'll, we'll look into that. Thanks, Tony. We have your, we can DM you about that. Um, thanks again to everyone who came out for the live show. It was great. It was packed. And uh, we actually, it's, we're going to come full circle and refer to that, that live show that we did with Miko Pellet in a second. Uh, also, make sure that you join us right after the stream. So around 8.30, I'll be on call-in where I'll take your calls, your questions, your comments, all of that jazz. And that's a free app called Colin that you can access. The link is at the beginning of the description in the YouTube description for this video. And it's going to be a great show. We got pre-taped interview. We got live interview. We got a voice from Italy. We got a voice from uh, Scandinavia slash America slash um, Hebron. So I'm going to bring in our, our special guest who has an emergency report. Now, those of you who remember the live show that we did um, with Miko Pellet, the Israeli human rights activist, you may remember that he warned that people needed to get ready to defend the life and liberty of Isa Amro. And uh, he is an activist. We're going to hear more about him, and we're going to hear about him from a special guest named Amaya Garner. Amaya Garner is a Scandinavian American human rights advocate and coordinator for international advocacy for youth against settlements and friends of Hebron. At the age of 19, she spent more than a year in Hebron witnessing daily human rights violations and has since campaigned internationally. She wrote her bachelor's dissertation on the architecture and resistance in Hebron city at UCL in London. So without any further ado, welcome Maya. Well, thank you so much for having me. Of course. Thanks for joining. Tell us about Isa Amro, who he is and what the breaking news about him is. Mm. So basically, first, uh, you know, a bit about where uh, where Isa works, which is Hebron. And um, if you haven't been to Hebron or um, if you don't know much about Hebron, then, you know, you won't know that it is an absolute um, dystopia nightmare. Um, it is an incredibly intense place. Uh, it is a hot spot for the Israeli uh, violence from soldiers, from settlers, and just a, uh, a living museum of human rights violations. And that is um, 
that is the place where a guy like Asa has to carry out his human rights work. And unfortunately, um, a lot of that work is not only about defending the rights of his people, but just, you know, trying himself to stay safe. And what happened uh, yesterday is that he was summoned to the Israeli police station and arrested only days after filming a video of an Israeli soldier beating up an Israeli activist. Um, and if we can take a look at the video, um, then uh, if we can play the video, the first one, then we will see that um, soldier grabs the activist from behind, beats him, and um, yeah. And this is an Israeli citizen. This is an Israeli citizen. Um, he was part of a tour of Israelis that went to the city to visit uh, Palestinian families. And um, clearly the assault on him was completely unwarranted. Um, but not only is this an incident of just, you know, Israeli brutality, which was documented since, as, as you know, most cases uh, go, you know, just um, know done in, in the dark. Right. Um, and um, another soldier at the scene added another uh, political dimension to this. Um, and if we see the next clip, we'll see the soldier oh, confronting oh, Asa. Oh, um, he says that Ben Gvir will clean up this place. Um, he will, and Ben Gvir, you know, by the way, people know because we've gone over this, but he's this extreme right wing racist uh, member of uh, Netanyahu's government, right? Who uh, exactly. has whipped it, like had a gun that he took out and uh, to scare off Palestinians. Uh, he's calls for ethnic cleansing, et cetera, et cetera. So here's the soldier mm -hmm. talking about him. And he resides at the outskirts of Hebron. And um, he says that, you know, so, you know, he will fuck you up. He will, um, you know, get rid of your whorehouse. And uh, Isa says, what, what have I done that's illegal? The soldier says, everything you do is illegal. Um, you know, I determine the law. Right. And um, yeah. that shows how uh, Israeli soldiers as well as settlers have been emboldened by the recent Israeli elections. And a guy like Ben Gvir, who, um, by the way, knows Asa personally from the confrontations that they've had with each other, um, if we see the picture, um, then this is just uh, to show a moment where we stand at this uh, situation, this intimate situation of as an um, extremist settler confronting a um, local Palestinian in, um, you know, backed by Israeli soldiers. So what happened? Mm -hmm. Sorry, before, can you just set up a little bit what Hebron is and why yeah. it's at in the center of this fight over settlements? Yes. So Hebron is say for Jerusalem, uh, is the largest Palestinian city in the West Bank. It's located deep inside the West Bank, and yet it has uh, Israeli settlements in its center, in the city center, um, protected by uh, Israeli soldiers. We're talking about a few hundred settlers in a city of more than 200,000 Palestinians, um, which, of course, you know, have suffered under the heavy amount of restrictions imposed upon them um, in the old city, which has, you know, is, is a um, beautiful old city. It, it is the um, location of the Ibrahimi Mosque or the Tomb of the Patriarchs, which is the alleged burial place of Abraham. Um, and it has something like, uh, I think, 20 to 22 big checkpoints in uh an area as small as like one square kilometer and more than 100 movement barriers. Um, its main street is closed. Um, the, the shops, the markets, they were closed down, shut down while um, the Israeli forces are protecting the settlers in you know, their quest for settlement expansion, in their quest for taking over this old city. And uh, of course, this is something that uh, Isa Amro resists. And his house 
is located directly next to an Israeli settlement. Um, and his house has then, for that reason, become a target of um, settler violence, of soldier violence, because the settlers want that house um, and they want to get rid of him. And what we saw as in, uh, even leading up to the Israeli elections, we saw a massive, uh, massive amount of violence, of harassment, of assaults, of throwing stones toward the house, throwing stones toward people, at death threats, you know, so many you can't count them. Um, and uh, Asa went to file a complaint on October 30th, and the police station would not take his complaint. They would not let him in. They would not let, let him file a complaint against Israeli settler harassment. The next day, his house was declared a closed military zone for, you know, meaning that nobody can enter. It left Asa alone there, isolated. Um, they, they enforced that closed military zone order for 10 days. And um, now their next step is then what we see uh, is this punishment for filming the video. Um, and even the Israeli activist who was beaten was, um, was placed under house arrest. And, um, and um, you know, this is not the first incident that we have of um, interrupting um, peaceful documentation of human rights abuses. Um, we, yeah, we have many other uh, videos of that. Um, but the point being is that, um, you know, Asa did nothing wrong. He filmed a soldier assaulting an activist. And because that was filmed, because the video gained traction in the media and embarrassed the army, now he's being punished for it. He has been arrested. He, he was, you know, when I say summoned to the police station, I'm not talking about sending an official document. I'm talking about him receiving a phone call and not being informed of why he had to go to the police station, uh, then showing up, questioned and arrested. And his, we don't know where he is. His lawyer was not informed uh, of his whereabouts. They, you know, the authorities would not tell her. And um, tomorrow, he is supposed to uh, have a day, uh, a day in court in um, Ofa military court. And um, it's very likely that they're going to uh, extend his detention. Um, but this is, you know, this is a reality for a human rights defender who, by the way, has a lot of international recognition, um, is probably the Palestinian with the most international support, international recognition, at least among the activists. And this is his life. This, you know, he, um, this has been going on for a long time and now it's escalating to a very uh, alarming degree. Um, and it's, you know, it's, uh, it's just terrible. Yeah, in fact, let's show this video that's his pinned tweet, because I think this one, yeah. this is a tweet that he tweeted out, life under the occupation, I'm detained now by Israeli soldiers in my own city for talking to my camera about apartheid. They want to shut off our voices. So this is from um, back in April 30th. So let's just watch this, and, and it's only gotten worse since then. Occupation and apartheid in Hebron. We as Palestinians are suffering from uh, occupation and separation and inequality. We uh, okay, okay, black. Soldier tells him not to film to put the camera away. He wants to film. He says, "You're filming me." You know, Issa says, "No, I'm allowed to film." And the soldier says, um, "You know, you can either stop filming or be arrested right now." And you know, and of course, this, you know, this happens all the time. Um, this just happened to be caught. I was detained because I am right. practicing my right to film and do small films. Ma. So what? Yeah, mm -hmm. keep going. Anyway, so this is just to, to show that you know, Asa is very used to these situations, even as horrible as they are. You can see he's even uh, he's continuing documenting even as this is, you know, happening to him. Um, right. And so what are people going to do? Because I remember Miko, when he spoke about this, he was very scared that his that Issa's life is uh, at risk. Now he's been apprehended. Uh, he's been unable to speak to his lawyer. So what needs to be done now? 
Well, we need to do the only thing that can be done, which is put as much international pressure on Israel as possible. And this can take many forms. It can take the form of simply uh, public awareness, especially here. Um, I know that uh, is the Israeli activists are working on something in their society, but it, you know that's not where we are going to see change. Change has to come from uh, the international community. And um, we're notifying organizations. We're calling for the support from diplomats. Um, if they keep him, we'll call for the support from, you know, parliamentarians in Europe, from, um, you know, uh, fr from uh, representative senators in the U.S. And, um, you know, it, these type of things cannot go on. Uh, you know, you know, uh, without consequences. Right. And my fear is that just half a year ago or, or so, we saw the killing of an American citizen and journalist. And, you know, um, we, you know, so we know, we know that the line extends to journalists. And we, I mean, we knew that in the past, but also to American citizens. And Israel is not facing any consequences for this. Um, but, the, you know, this is what we have to do. We have to keep um, moving this issue. We have to keep protecting human rights defenders. You know, it's, we're spending a ridiculous amount of time protecting the people who are simply trying to protect their own people. Um, and, you know, but, but you know, we, we have to go through our own politicians here in the U.S., especially... Uh, the, the U.S. is not really doing much, um, but it, it has a larger uh, voice here. Right. Um, and if we can't reach the politicians, we have to reach our, you know, our community, organizations, anyone that we can, essentially. Um, and what is uh, use against Hebron, uh, oops, use against settlements and Friends of Hebron, what do they do, those two organizations? Yeah, so Youth Against Settlements is the grassroots initiative that was founded by ASA. It is Palestinian-led, and it's based of local Palestinians and in Hebron that um, do various community organizing. Um, part of that is, of course, protecting the community in the most um, heavily restricted areas, um, in the most vulnerable areas, as we see a lot of people moving out of the areas because it's impossible to live there. Um, we see peaceful direct actions. Uh, I know Asa himself has been inspired by Dr. King, um, by, of course, Gandhi, and, you know, by the philosophy of nonviolence. Um, and he's been training uh, young volunteers in uh, camera documentation, camera distribution to keep track of the human rights violations, to keep, you know, provide evidence of the human rights violations, and also to train people in nonviolence. And, um, you know, if, you know, the international community wants to see uh, peaceful, you know, peaceful activities, this is peaceful activities, and this is what's happening to the peaceful activists. Um, this is how they're being punished. And um, other, you know, it, international campaigns, um, calling attention, you know, using Hebron as a case study of the occupation. Um, and uh, yeah, m m many other things. And what are, the, we have some more videos to show, right? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, we can show another of, um, you know. There's a blind, where he's blindfolded. Can yeah. you set that one up? Yeah. So he, this is just one uh, example of just general harassment. You know, the soldiers laughing as they've detained him at the checkpoint, blindfolded him. Um, again, this happens sporadically. It's, you know, it's... Um, I know that in 2012, um, Asa was arrested and detained in this way more than 20 times just in that year. Um, it is a harassment campaign with the intent to shut down his activities. Asa has been an activist for 20 years, almost 20 years. Um, he's, he's going to continue, but 
you know, so is the harassment. Um, and, you know, my fear is that they're running out of methods to try to stop him. And that, you know, um, well, um, you know, I, I think it's only reasonable to be extremely worried. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Anything else that you want to make sure we know about? Anything else you want to show us, uh, mention? Um, well, you can you can follow what's happening on social media. Um, there is um, there is the Youth Against Settlements Facebook page. Um, there's the Friends of Hebron website, and um, yeah, the court date is tomorrow. So please follow updates for what what happens next. So that'll be Wednesday. So people watching this, you may by the time you watch it, if you're not watching it live, there may be updates. So we will. Mm -hmm. add those updates is there a hashtag um um not, not yet not yet okay. we'll launch like if they don't release them tomorrow we'll launch a larger campaign um a hashtag from the past has been stand with asa amro okay or stand with asa um another t hashtag that we'll probably be using would be free asa amro um but that will depend on whether or not they they keep him right okay yeah. So we'll thank you for this update and we'll uh, let people know more about what can be done as, uh, as we learn about it, as we find out. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Maya. Okay. That was a breaking news update. Thank you, Maya. Thanks for that um, incredibly important uh, piece of news. And we will update you. We'll put links that she mentioned in the description. Um, and we have even more show for you. So very exciting. And don't forget that you can become uh, Patreon subscribers to the Katie Helper Show. And if you do that, you'll get an extended interview with Stefania Maurizzi, who uh, I spoke to. And you're going to see a great interview I did with her. And to get the full interview, you can go to uh, patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Also, please do like this stream if you haven't already liked it. Please do subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Hit subscribe and then and then click the bell. You can also join the YouTube channel and become members and you get cool emojis and badges. And I want to remind people I'll be on call-in uh, later tonight right after this, this stream. I'll take people's questions and um, uh calls and questions at Colin, which is this free app that you can use on your phone and uh, you can ask me your thing, your questions. Um, what else do I want to say? Okay. So there's some breaking news, by the way, that I want to share. Uh, it's a little bit late, but better late than never. So um, the New York times, uh, the guardian, Le Monde, Der Spiegel and El País, who are all uh, publications that worked with Julian Assange with WikiLeaks They've come together as of November 28th. They came together and they published a letter. Um, Brad, do we have that? If not, I can screen share. Did I send that to you? No, okay. They published a letter that I'm going to share the screen with you so you can see it. In fact, Stefania Maurizzi, the guest who we're going to hear from next, she addresses this in our interview. So you'll hear more about it then. But here is some sadly recent news that should have come out a long time ago, but it's an open letter from the editors and publishers. Publishing is not a crime. The U.S. government should end its prosecution of Julian Assange for publishing secrets. 12 years ago, on November 28, 2010, our five international media outlets published a series of revelations in cooperation with WikiLeaks that made the headlines around the globe. Cablegate, a set of 251,000 confidential cables from the U.S. State Department disclosed corruption, diplomatic scandals, and spy affairs on an international scale. In the words of the New York Times, the documents told the unvarnished story of how the government makes its biggest decisions, the decisions that cost the country most heavily in lives and money. Even now in 2022, journalists and historians continue to push new revelations using the unique trove of documents. For Julian Assange, publisher of WikiLeaks, the publication of Cablegate and several other related leaks had the most severe consequences. On April 11th, 2019, Assange was arrested in London on a U.S. arrest warrant and has now been held for three and a half years in a high security British prison, usually used for terrorists and members of organized crime groups. He faces extradition to the U.S. and a sentence of up to 175 years in an American maximum security prison. 
This group of editors and publishers, all of whom had worked with Assange, felt the need to publicly criticize his conduct in 2011 when unredacted copies of the cables were released. And some of us are concerned about the allegations in the indictment that he attempted to aid in computer intrusion of a classified database. But we come together now to express our grave concerns about the continued prosecution of Julian Assange for obtaining and publishing classified materials. The Obama, oops, the Obama, um, the Obama Biden administration in office during the WikiLeaks publication in 2010 refrained from indicting Assange, explaining that they would have had to indict journalists from major news outlets too. Their position placed a premium on press freedom, despite its uncomfortable consequences. Under Donald Trump, however, the position changed. The DOJ relied on an old law, the Espionage Act of 1917, designed to prosecute potential spies during World War I, which has never been used to prosecute a publisher or broadcaster. The indictment sets a dangerous precedent and threatens to undermine America's First Amendment and the freedom of the press. Holding governments accountable is part of the core mission of a free press in a democracy. Obtaining and disclosing sensitive information when necessary in the public interest is a core part of the daily work of journalists. If that work is criminalized, our public discourse and our democracies are made significantly weaker. Twelve years after the publication of Cablegate, it is time for the U.S. government to end its prosecution of Julian Assange for publishing secrets. Publishing is not a crime. From the editors and publishers of the New York Times, The Guardian, Le Monde, Der Spiegel, El País. So, as Stefania mentions in the interview that we're about to watch, had these people come out uh, and defended Julian Assange before that, he probably wouldn't be in the state he's in now, which is a very bad state. He's had a stroke. Um, he has had major psychological damage done. He's been tortured by through solitary confinement. The UN Special Rapporteur on Torture has described the, his treatment as torture, and that guy basically knows what he's talking about. He is the Special Rapporteur on Torture for the United Nations. Nils Melzer really, really recommend his book. Um, so, uh, that is an important piece of context for the interview that we're about to play. Also, wow, thank you, Pomodorino. Almost missed it. Thanks so much, Katie, for hosting Stefani as well. Please, everyone, appreciate how brave a journal must be to work on this subject in a country heavily influenced by the only theocracy, absolute monarchy of Europe. Yeah, Stefania is really, truly amazing, and, and you're going to see that in a second. So um, I think that's all I need to do to set this up. Let me just tell you a little bit about Stefania. Uh, very, very impressive guest, as you'll see. She is an investigative journalist working for the daily Il Fatto Quotidiano, having previously reported for La Repubblica and L'Espresso. Um, hold on, I want a better, I have a better bio for her in the description. I hope this doesn't make noise. Okay. Ah, all right. So, um, okay. Uh, she has worked on all WikiLeaks releases of secret documents since 2009. She's also the only journalist who has conducted multi-jurisdictional litigation to defend the right of the press to access the full documentation on Julian Assange and the WikiLeaks journalists. In addition to her work on WikiLeaks, she has partnered with Glenn Greenwald to reveal the Snowden files about Italy. She's also interviewed A.Q. Khan, the father of the Pakistani atomic bomb, revealed the condolence payment agreement between the U.S. government and the family of Italian aid worker Giovanni Laporto, killed in a U.S. drone strike, and investigated the harsh working conditions of Pakistani workers in a major Italian garment factory in Karachi. In her book, Secret Power, WikiLeaks and Its Enemies, she constructs the Assange and WikiLeaks case based on her over 10 years of investigative journalism. The Italian version of her book has won two major journalistic prizes, and uh, she's also won a number of prizes herself outside of this book including the Armenese Harvard Fellowship and the Columbia Doro Award. Uh, Colombia, sorry, not the university. Columbia Doro Award conferred by Archivio Di Sarmo. Um, so I think that's enough of the bio, but uh, let's play this great interview with Stefania Maurizzi. I'm so excited to be talking to Stefania Maurizzi, who is the author of this really amazing book, Secret Power, WikiLeaks and Its Enemies. It has a great forward also by Ken Loach, for those of you who know that great director. Uh, welcome, Stefania. Thank you, Katie, for having me. Of course. 
this is a really great book because it's about something that's really interesting and important, but also what's really cool about it is that it's well-written. It has kind of like a thriller feel to it. Um, so it's a Thank really you. easy, uh, quick read. How long have you, had you been working on it? Well, the book is based on 13 years of investigative work on the documents and the case, seven years of FOI litigation in US, UK, Sweden, Australia, and two years and five months of writing work. So a lot of time, actually. Tell us about how you first met Julian Assange. You talk about it in the book, but I think it's cool to hear about it from you. Uh, yes, <laughs> it's pretty, you know, it's um, it was 2008 when I uh, got interested in WikiLeaks because one of my journalistic sources uh, suddenly stopped talking to me. She didn't want to meet me. Uh, she was convinced she was under illegal interception. And of course, Katie, there is no way to know whether you are under illegal interception. It might be just a paranoia or it might be real. So, but for me, it was very important that my source stopped talking to me and didn't want to me at all. Because it was precisely at that time that I realized that I needed better source protection. Because the, you know, the, what we have in, uh, in our, uh, <clears throat> we use on a daily basis, our mobile phones, our emails are very vulnerable. These are not technologies suitable for the 21st century where, uh, surveillance is widespread it's very easy to penetrate our mobiles it's very easy to penetrate our uh, emails so at that point i told myself i have to use better source protection and you know katie i'm a, I'm, a, I'm a mathematician as a background before journalism i took a degree in maths so for me it was quite natural to think maybe i can use cryptography i didn't i didn't know how to use it at that time because uh, i w i had just a kind of theoretical knowledge of cryptography but i know that that cri that cryptography could protect um, communication so it was one of my sources in the field of cryptography that told me well, you should have a look on that bunch of lunatics, the lunatics right. who were <laughs> Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, and he was calling them lunatics uh, with sympathy because uh, he was convinced that they were doing uh, uh, important work, especially in the uh, accountability sector, in the uh, in the making uh, the military industrial complex uh, accountable. So I started looking from the outside because at that time, 2008, WikiLeaks had been very, in the, at the very beginning, he had been uh, created by Julian Assange in October 2006. So it was at the very beginning, and very few knew about WikiLeaks. It was something, you know, uh, very um, specialistic and so on. So I was deeply impressed, Katy. I was absolutely impressed by the work because, for example, they had obtained the uh, Guantanamo manual, the right. task for, military task force, uh, which is managing the Guantanamo detention camp. And the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, had tried to get this manual for uh, in all sorts, of, trying all sorts of approach using the FOI request and so on, but they were, uh, they had been unable to get it. But WikiLeaks got it. But what impressed me was not just that WikiLeaks had obtained it, it was also that WikiLeaks had uh, said no to the Pentagon, who had asked to remove the, the document from their website. I'm not sure if you remember that after the 9-11, the media were so compliant with whatever the, the Pentagon and the CIA, the military industrial complex was asking them. Of course, they were powerful ex exception like Seymour Hirsch and a few others, of course, there were. But at that time, it was very, the media were very compliant. And so that courage by WikiLeaks of saying no to the Pentagon for me was, uh, was something really, really, uh, you know, it, it gave me hope that maybe another kind of journalism was possible. 
And so I started looking from the outside uh, and suddenly I started trying to uh, look for contacts with them and try to ask people who had met them, knew them, uh, how they were, who they were, how they uh, operated. So I um, basically uh, established the first contacts at the very beginning from the outside. And then in the middle of the night, suddenly in July 2009, uh, they called me in the middle of the night and I was sleeping. It was July in Rome, very hot and sticky. And, and the last thing I wanted to do is was uh, standing up and listening and talking on the phone. But the phone was ringing and ringing and ringing. So at the end, I woke up and uh, I said, and I was told, we are Wikileaks, so you should go to your computer. We have a document. Uh, it is an Italian document. We think it is genuine, but we need an, an Italian journalist trying to verify whether it's, uh, it's authenticity and to understand the local context. So I woke up, I went to my computer and downloaded the file because they had told me, you have an hour. Otherwise, we will remove it. And I was listening that file because it was an audio file. And it was really important because it was about alleged state mafia deals about the garbage crisis in, in, in Naples, which had made, you know, headlines all around the world. So uh, the morning after I called the people involved mentioning that audio file, realized that the document was absolutely uh, genuine and I published it for the first time in Ju in um, August 2009 and that was my first media partnership with with Julian Assange and Wikileaks before the collateral murder before Wikileaks made a sensation about their publication so that was the first time but I still didn't know Julian in person you know and uh, so I, it took a while before I knew him, met him, and uh, tried to understand what kind of person he is. And uh, you have to realize, Katy, that I have worked on the Wikileaks case, on the Wikileaks documents for over a decade. And the last time I met Julian, and he was free, was September 2010. After September 2010, I have always met Julian either under house arrest or confined in the embassy. He, he, had lost, he has lost his freedom and still have to regain his freedom, basically. This is appalling if you think that he has spent more than a decade either under house arrest or confined in an embassy and now in Belmarsh. It's a, it's a, I believe it's a scandal. It's a massive scandal. I mean, and what was it like when you met him and what was he like? Well, it was very, uh, it was super intelligent. He's a uh, kind of genius, Julian, even, uh, you know, he's, um, he has this ability to understand, uh, not just technology, he, he also understand power, which is quite, which is not so common because most of the time you have these super smart people who understand technology, but they don't understand power. They don't, they have no clue on how our society works or how power works. So you, you, you scratch your head and you say, well, so much talent and they don't, they just understand technology. They have a narrow focus on technologies, but they cannot understand what's around them and how societies works and how the power acts. Whereas with Julian, you realize that he understands power, he understands technology, and he has a lot of courage because he, you need to have a lot of courage to reveal collateral murder, to reveal the Afghan war logs, and to spend your life uh, as he has spent uh, confined in prison. You know, it's uh, they they took their best years. They took it, uh, and even if he will at the end he will be free, no one will give him those best years of his life. You know, this is really sad if you think about this this case completely. You know, it's a monstrous injustice as. 
Kelloch writes in his foreword to my book. Can you tell us about what the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Center is and what it said in a document that WikiLeaks actually published? Yes, that was one of the very first document Julian Assange WikiLeaks published. And I remember because um, basically after I published the documentation about Italy in uh, August 2009, Julian had disappeared. I understood that they were operating this way. They were publishing and then disappearing like kind of rebels, you know, that they hit and run, you know? Right. So I was uh, wondering where where they had gone, what, what they were doing. And suddenly one day, Julian Assange contacted me and he wanted uh, that I look at this document that WikiLeaks had just published. And it was a document about WikiLeaks, a secret document about WikiLeaks. And the document was uh, an analysis by this counter uh, espionage um, uh, center of the US Army, which was looking at WikiLeaks. And uh, their analysis was that WikiLeaks was a threat for the US Army, for the US military industrial complex. And so they, their idea was that uh, not to approach WikiLeaks as an authoritarian state would do it. So uh, destroying it, killing them, and uh, blocking their website and so on. Uh, but the plan was going after the sources so that and destroy the credibility of the website so, so, so that their sources would think twice before leaking documents to WikiLeaks. Because as you know, journalism is based on, you know, on trust. You have to trust. There must be trust between the source and the journalist. Otherwise, uh, the, <laughs> it's not possible <laughs> to work together, you know. So if you destroy the trust, if you uh, go after the sources, and you expose them and you arrest them, you destroy them, uh, no one would leak to them because they, uh, the other sources would say, well, their source had been destroyed. So uh, I, I, have, I have serious concern. <laughs> I don't want to put my life on the line, you know? So the plan was going after WikiLeaks sources to destroy their the trust of the sources in order to to have WikiLeaks no longer obtaining leaks. And that was at the very beginning, the documents was going, went back to the very first years of WikiLeaks existence. So WikiLeaks became a target very, very early for the US Army. So I was even impressed by that document because the plan was much more subtle they, you know, the U.S. Army didn't didn't plan to send killers. Didn't plan to, you know, as an authoritarian state would do would do, you know. But they will be brutal enough to go after journalistic sources. And of course, there is no way to do serious investigative work without, if you are unable to protect your sources. I'm just looking at what they had said, but it was almost like a roadmap to what they were going to do. Um, yeah. In terms of not just Julian Assange, but also the way that they went after Chelsea Manning. Yeah, in fact, Chelsea Manning, we realized that they were doing precisely this, what the counter, the counter intelligence center of the US Army was uh, at plan when Chelsea Manning was arrested, they went after her. They went, they arrested her. So there was a chilling effect right. on all sources, you know? And so right. sources we start saying, I, I don't want to end up like her. Uh, so I, I want to stay away because I mean, I don't want to end up like her. Yeah, they write, the, the document that, that you quote says, WikiLeaks uses trust as a center of gravity by assuring insiders, leakers, and whistleblowers who pass information of WikiLeaks personnel or who post information to the website that they will remain anonymous. The identification, exposure, or termination of employment of or legal actions against current or former insiders, leakers, or whistleblowers could damage or destroy the center of gravity. And yeah. so we see them obviously uh, using legal actions against 
Assange, um, Snowden, and Manning, just among uh, others. And so they basically, they kind of showed their hand here. Absolutely. They, yeah. This is precisely what they have done. They, they are gone after Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, Daniel Hale, reality right. winner, you know, all of them, you know? Yeah. It's interesting. You had the kind of meta investigation, like on one level, you were doing exposing WikiLeaks stories or you were exposing things that WikiLeaks was working on or WikiLeaks had obtained. But then you also were exposing stories about the treatment of WikiLeaks. And that was part one of my interview with Stefania. Uh, we have more that we're going to play now, but, uh, and thank you very much, Wadesworth, for your very generous donation. Um, this again is an interview that I did with Stefania Maurizzi, and uh, we're going to play some more. But just so you know, right after this, I have a whole section with her that's Patreon only, which you can find later this week at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And uh, we get into the whole, uh, into a lot of the of the behind the scenes between Stefania and uh, the English prosecutor and the Swedish prosecutor. And it's pretty fascinating. Uh, it's a very, very interesting. There's a lot of intrigue. It's, there you she, she really exposes a lot of how uh, invested the British war in not having, uh, in trying to get Julian Assange out of the embassy because uh, they knew that they wanted to, basically because, sorry, I'm not doing a great job explaining this because it's in the interview. We're going to have to cut this out when we release this because I look like I'm very uh, distracted. But it's so complicated. It's both not complicated. It's a very simple story of persecution and prosecution. But it also, because they did so many things to him, it gets complicated. And this is the problem. So we really drill down into those details in this Patreon-only section. And we clear up a lot of things. And we clear up the rape allegations and what he was accused of, what he actually did do, how the Swedish and the British were not actually interested in investigating the rape. They just basically used it to smear him and to stall him and keep him trapped. So I highly recommend that. That's at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. But uh, we're going to hear some more from uh, Stefania. And this is where she talks about being spied on. You yourself were spied on. In fact, let me just share a photo. So here's one photo of you and, and Julian Assange. Where is this? And when is this? Well, that was 2012. And it was February 2010, 2012. And it was basically the last time that I met Julian and he was under house arrest. He was not free. 2012, right. he was not free. He was under house arrest, but he was not yet in the embassy. So okay. here it was outside the embassy. Okay. And then here he is. Uh, here's another picture of you that I'd like you to comment on. Where is this and what kind of photo is this? Yeah, this is the embassy, the Ecuadorian embassy in London. This is this picture was taken the 29 December of 2017. I basically it was just a month after I had discovered the destruction of crucial documents about the case, the Julian Assange case. And I went to the embassy to discuss many things, including the destruction of documents. I couldn't have imagined what was going on behind the scenes. Basically, we were while we were talking, uh, someone got access to my backpack and uh, accessed my phones, unscrewed my phones, and took pictures of my phones, took pictures of all my USB sticks. I had very, very important documents. So I have no idea where the, fortunately I had encrypted everything. Let's hope encryption worked <laughs> and they were not able to get access to this um, uh, data, this, my, this data. And uh, we discovered this only because they took pictures. So at the end of the day, uh, the Spanish police, because the company was a Spanish company, the Spanish police, got these pictures and videos 
So we have evidence of these spying activities. I find a criminal complaint in Spain, and I hope the Spanish judges and the police will be able to, uh, to tell us what they really did, what they accessed, what they were looking for. It was, uh, you know, it was uh, something that you expect in, um, in an authoritarian state. You know, but this happened in London. This happened in the heart of Europe. It didn't happen in North Korea or Russia or China. This is real, uh, you know, and we were treating Julian as a paranoid, as a, you know, but he was not paranoid at all. He was right from the very beginning. Even when, uh, you know, today we see, we see that uh, finally the New York Times, the Le Monde, Guardian, El País, Der Spiegel, uh, call on the U.S. government yeah, to drop the case. Finally, after 12 years, finally they do this. But, you know, if they had done something before, probably we were not in this situation, no? Yeah. You know, if you, have to, if you think that it took an Italian journalist to try to get this documentation, I call it my trench warfare, because it took a, a warfare to, <laughs> to try to get this documentation, you know? And it's not possible that a journalist that has revealed war crimes has spent 12 years in these conditions. It's not right. possible. Now, you weren't the only journalist spied on, but you're the only one who filed a FOIA, right? Or who acted anything about this? We know, like, um, the Washington Post national security correspondent, she was spied on. Did you get any solidarity or any other people joining you when you move forward on this? I tried to contact the, the Washington Post national security correspondent, Ellen Nakashima, who had been targeted inside the Ecuadorian embassy, and tried to ask her whether she was interested in filing, joining my criminal complaint. Unfortunately, I never got a reply. And I don't think she filed it at all. Others filed it because they were targeted. And uh, even the German colleagues filed their own criminal complaint, but nothing from the US journalists at all. And, and you had to pay for this out of your pocket, these FOIA requests? This is a good question, Katie. Is um, uh, this is the missing chapter in my book? There is a missing chapter. I didn't write what happened to me because, you know, what happened to me is basically nothing about uh, right. with respect to what happened to Julian Assange. He has spent twelve years in this condition, but even for me, it has been really hard. Actually, I had to leave my newspaper to be able to keep doing this work on the WikiLeaks case. I had to leave La Repubblica after 14 years of work for La Repubblica and L'Espresso. They were in the same news group. And it was really hard. Uh, my income collapsed from 4,000 to 3,000 per year. So it has been, and they didn't provide me legal assistance in this case, even if I had been there in the embassy for them. So our journalistic contract required them to protect me legally in this case. But unfortunately, I didn't get any legal assistance and I had to leave. And today I work for a different newspaper for, an, for Il Fatto Quotidiano, but it has been really, really hard. And what did they say? Why weren't they going to protect you legally or financially, give you they, financial tools to go after this? Well, they basically did not reply, did not uh, reply at all. And, uh, you know, no one tells you, uh, you don't have to cover this topic. It's much more subtle. <laughs> you know, right. you realize that everything becomes so difficult. Suddenly <laughs> things uh, started becoming so difficult. So uh, it, they require such much effort, such a big effort that you realize that your work is no longer uh, welcome. You, it's no longer accepted. So you have two options. You either conform yourself, you are compliant, and you realize that the, the editors and the, 
property want another kind of work, no longer that kind of work, or you decide that you want to go ahead and uh, do whatever it is necessary, and you are in a collision course with your newspaper, and so you have to leave, which is what they did. I decided that my work was much more important than my newspaper. So I could find another newspaper, maybe. Uh, I it was a jump in the dark. I had no, I had no idea whether I would have found another <laughs> newspaper. I was lucky. I was ready to go on Substack on on any platform because I had no certainty that I would find another newspaper. And so it has been really, really hard. But this is a chapter which maybe one day I will write, but takes some detachment, you know. Right. And now the priority is that Julian Assange is uh, is free now, the, and the case uh, is dropped. The pro that's the priority. It's not me. I don't want to be at the sure. center. I'm not. Uh, my troubles are not in compared to him, you know? Yeah, it pales, com it, it pales in comparison compared to him. But it's still an important thing to acknowledge and to look at because this is just one of the many examples of disincentives against reporting on this. Like you said, this is nothing compared to what Assange went through. This is just another example of the thing that we saw at the beginning laid out by the uh, U.S. Army Counterintelligence Center yes, and how yeah. they wanted to seek to basically make life difficult, fire people, take legal action against, uh, smear, discredit, delegitimize people involved in this. There was also a, a plan uh, which came out, which was discovered in 2012. Basically, it was a plan to uh, for some dirty wars techniques against WikiLeaks, and one and part of this plan was to disrupt the support from mainstream journalists. In in this case, they were discussing uh, the support by Glenn Greenwald, in particular, a major <laughs> important um, journalist and public figure. And the plan was uh, uh, these professionals are liberal professionals, but basically put uh, if they have to choose between their career and the cause they probably will will opt for their professional preservation well they were wrong i didn't hope for <laughs> for that in my case i hoped for the cause because i think it's an important is an absolutely important cause i absolutely want want to win this case uh, i absolutely want to want to use my journalistic work to create a society in which you can reveal uh, war crimes and torture and you are free and you don't sleep in Belmarsh. You sleep with your family, with Stella, you sleep with your children. You don't have to pay such a high price. You know, I really care about this case beyond Julian Assange and, and Wikileaks. Uh, you know, it is about the society you want. I don't want to live in a society in which for revealing war crimes or mass surveillance or uh, torture, you have to go to Belmarsh in prison or you have to kill your, try to kill yourself three times as Chelsea Manning tried to do, or you have to ask for asylum to Russia. I don't want to live in a society like this. Like Edward you know? Snowden did, right. Exactly. Yeah. And speaking of Russia, you were um, there working on the Podesta uh, emails. Can you tell us what happened? And also, what does it tell us about the claim that Assange was a useful idiot for Russia and for Trump? Well, this is an important question, of course, because I remember that uh, in 2016, everyone was uh, mad, <laughs> Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, for publishing these documents. I remember that basically, uh, they had published the, um, the first batch, the first uh, documents about DNC emails, uh, and uh, and it was basically they had a huge impact because the the chairwoman of the um, Democratic National Committee had resigned. Debbie Wasserman Schultz resigned. So there was basically. <laughs> 
a mess. And uh, they had, were blamed because according to the mainstream media, they had published all this material at once. So with the Podesta image, they wanted to try to do better. Well, if we had been criticized for publishing all at once, maybe we should publish in different many uh, in a diff in a more uh, not all at once but right. in a staggered release right. so they contacted some media partners and i said yes i'm interested in working in the podesta emails because the italian democratic uh, party has deep links with the U.S. Democratic Party. So I, I was interested in this correspondence. And I realized that no one wanted to work on these files because, you know, they, there was such a kind of concern. Everyone was blaming WikiLeaks. I will, everyone was saying there is Russia behind, there is Russia, there is Russian, that no one wanted to work on this, on this documentation. I work on them. And uh, I cannot say that my editors were really happy. <laughs> I can say they were not really happy, but I work on them in any case. And um, uh, I realized that, uh, and I was alerted. I was alerted by them. And they told me, tomorrow we will publish. Tomorrow we will publish. So this was not a last minute decision because we we are told we were told that basically Julian Assange WikiLeaks decided to publish to publish the Podest, the first batch of Podesta emails a few minutes after the Hollywood uh, the Access Hollywood video and uh, according to the to the mainstream media he did it uh, for um, for helping Trump but that that this is not what I experienced. I mean, I'm not saying I know the truth in this case. I know what I have seen, what I have experienced, and what I have seen and what I have experienced is that they publish in uh, in a staggered release, not to make Hillary bleeding, but rather to avoid being attacked for publishing all at once. Right. This is the, the I'm I'm sure because we discussed this in several occasions, and I'm sure that they uh, and I'm, I'm sure it was not a last minute decision because I had been alerted the day before, so it was definitely not a last minute decision of publishing a few minutes after Access Hollywood. They had planned it at least the day before, at least they had informed me the day before you know right. so this is uh, this is completely this is a completely different story but whatever happened i say as i write in my book information trumps all and this is not just my opinion this is also what dean back the the new york times editor-in-chief um said to the bbc when he was interviewed about the podesta emails so he, he basically told the BBC, would I be, uh, would I feel, uh, you know, uncomfortable uh, about publishing something that maybe had been leaked by Russia? Of course I would be, but I would be much more uncomfortable of keeping in a, <laughs> in a drawer important right. documentation that the public has the right to know. Right, I'm, I'm sure the information was valuable because the Podesta email revealed behind the scene um, talks by Hillary Clinton to the financial giants. And even the New York Times had published an editorial asking Hillary Clinton to reveal uh, those talks before during the election because the public has the right to know what Hillary Clinton told the financial giants like Goldman Sachs and, and so on, right. you know? And even Mueller agreed with you in some, to some extent, uh, Robert Mueller in his decision. Whatever you his think findings. about Mueller, 
whatever you think about the Mueller report, there are many inconsistencies. I know. Yeah, absolutely. Aaron Mate <laughs> right. work yeah. on this, and there are many inconsistencies, uh, many, many, and they you have to realize that. In the, they investigated this case for two years and never questioned Julian Assange of WikiLeaks. I mean, the publication of these documents is at the center of the so-called Russia Gate, and they never questioned them. How, how can you explain this? Because the first thing is to question them, to right. question the media organization which published the documents at the center of the scandal, but they didn't, you know? There are many, many inconsistencies. Yeah. But at the same time, even, even, uh, even if you consider all these inconsistencies, which are very relevant, actually, very big, <laughs> Even in this case, you have to realize that at the end, the Mueller report find, found no evidence whatsoever of coordination between Julian Assange and WikiLeaks and the Trump campaign. And they look for it very hard. They look for it. And at the end of the day, found no evidence whatsoever to charge them. Had they found any evidence, they would have charged. Of course. For sure. Right. Yeah, and he even, I didn't think I knew this until I read your book, that he cited that, that certain things were protected. He cited a Supreme Court case and said that these yeah. publications were protected by the First Amendment, which I Absolutely. didn't realize. Yeah. That's kind of huge. So he's Absolutely. not exactly a, a liberal guy or an Assange fan, but even he does that. <laughs> he's he's he not. That. Yeah. Absolutely. And what's next for you and what's next for Julian? Well, I keep working on, I will keep working on this case because, uh, you know, I have dedicated so many years and I absolutely want, want to win this case. As I said, this uh, is not just about Julian Assange or WikiLeaks. It's not because I am obsessed about Julian Assange or WikiLeaks. It is because this case will decide whether in, um, in our Western countries, you can reveal war crimes and be safe and be free. I mean, this is what this is the uh, precisely what makes a difference between a dictatorship and a democracy. In a dictatorship, you cannot reveal state criminality at the highest level. They kill you. They send you killers like <laughs> Politkovsky. Yeah, they, you cannot do it in a in an authoritarian society, in a democracy, it must be possible. That's why I'm so, I'm so determined to uh, find the truth in this case and to expose the state involvement in his persecution. They have destroyed him. His his, his health is um, it's really destroyed. I don't know in which condition he will come out uh, from Belmarsh. To be honest, and. I have no idea because they have they have destroyed his health and we have witnessed this process and we are trying to alert the public. We are trying, we wrote articles, we wrote investigation, we wrote uh, books, we have done whatever we could, but at the same time his health has been destroyed. So I don't know how it will come out of the embassy, of the Belmarsh. He was already in bad, bad shape when he was inside the embassy in the last years, he was in really bad shape. I remember the last time I met him, he was uh, basically five months before he was arrested. I came out of the embassy and I wrote an email to my newspaper saying, he's dying. Julian Assange is dying. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, I have never seen him in such condition. So that was November 2018. Imagine how he is now in Belmarsh, in, a, in Britain's toughest prison after so many years and after all he had experienced, all he had went through in these years. So I'm very, very, I'm very, very concerned. But at the same time, I'm very, very determined to fight for uh, for him, for WikiLeaks, and for what they represent. It doesn't matter whether they are not perfect. I know many defects. I know many problems. Uh, it doesn't matter whether they are not perfect, but the, what they have done is absolutely important. And I absolutely want a society in which 
there is a media organization revealing this state criminality. I mean, this is the difference between what, between democracy and dictatorship. And so I completely agree with Ken Loach, who wrote that this is a monstrous injustice, absolutely agree. And I hope this uh, letter by the New York Times, the Guardian, the, uh, the, the five big media partners for cables will prompt other media condemning and asking for uh, the US, asking, calling the US authorities to drop the case, you know. I don't, I don't believe he has any hope in the legal process, Katie. I have seen so many irregularities, so many anomalies in the, in the whole legal process in Sweden, US. I don't, I don't believe that he has any chance to win the case legally. So the only chance is the public pressure, the pressure from the media, maybe the European Court of Human Rights, maybe, maybe. Hmm. But I really believe that the, the key is uh, the public pressure by the US uh, media, European media, international media, and the public opinion. Recently, uh, the editors and publishers of the New York Times, The Guardian, Le Monde, Der Spiegel, and El País, who were all media partners with Assange, they published an open letter uh, saying the US government should end its persecution of Julian Assange for publishing secrets. Why do you think it took so long for them to do that? And do you think, what kind of difference would it have made had they done this earlier, do you think? Had they done earlier, uh, Julian Assange would not be an, in Belmarsh. He, his health would have not been destroyed as he <laughs> has been. I'm sure about this. Unfortunately, they did not. And one of the reasons why they did not is, there are several reasons, of course. Uh, part is a pers matter of personality um, and clashes and so on. And, but in addition to this is the... Um, relentless demonization campaign uh, initially because the allegations were that he had put lives at risk and 12 years after we see no victims there are no victims we are you know we we have spent so many years um, concerned about the victims that never were and we we spent so much so little concerned about the uh, the actual victims, the victims of the war is in Afghanistan, in Iraq, the Guantanamo detainees, you know, you know, the, this campaign of the blood in their hands was, um, was basically fog of war, was a way to manipulate the public debate from the very beginning, because the first time that the US authorities accused Julian Assange of, and Wikileaks of having bloods on their hands was 2010, immediately after they started publishing the documents on the war in Afghanistan. And since then, the US authorities are, have been unable to find a single victim, a man killed, a man injured, a man put in prison. They have not, they have not found a single example, you know. So first was blood on their hands, then rape. And we had this rape campaign for nine years, nine years, because the investigation was opened in 2010 and finally was closed in 2019. For 19 for nine years, he had been treated as a rapist. Without you know? being questioned. Of course, and uh, you know, and the the kind of people who, and these uh, these basically um, um, destroyed any empathy from the public, you know, yeah. especially from that pa part of the public who cares about women's rights, yeah. who often have the very same uh, that care about, uh, you know, war crimes Justice or transparency and exactly. journalism, exactly. right? Exactly. Right. Then we had this campaign about the Russia, Russian and the Russians. And even in this case, no evidence, no evidence whatsoever. You know, it was just the media reporting what the US authorities were telling them, nothing, no evidence whatsoever. Then we had the hate campaign about Trump. <laughs> so, I mean, all this, all this demonization campaign has been going on since 2010 for the last 12 years, you know, 
And each time there was, uh, you know, a, a pretext not to be, <laughs> to stand in solidarity with Julian Assange, whether it was uh, the rape, whether it was Trump, whether it was Russia, whether it was the blood in the hands. Each time there was a pretext. So now that the media finally have seen that he was not, he was right from the very beginning. The US was after him. The US want to arrest him and to charge him and to put him in prison for his publication, not for the rape, not for other reason. Now that they have realized this, now that this is undeniable, <laughs> you know, is uh, under our eyes, now they finally step out and call the US authorities. But it's too, I don't think it is too late, in a sense, it's still possible to, do, to change the course in, uh, of, of the justice in this case, but certainly it's too late for him because his health has been destroyed, you know? So I think at the end they did <laughs> what they should have done 12 years ago, yeah. but it's very late, very, very late. It's still not too late to, sa to save him because he hasn't been extradited yet. And if he will be extradited, he will be his death. He will be his physical death, political death, professional death. Uh, at the same time, there are still opportunity to save him. So it is important that they finally step out and call on the US authorities to drop the case against him. You were someone who witnessed something that he did that undermines the claim that he has blood on his hands, that he was reckless, that he had put people's lives at risk because you were there when there was a major breach. Can you just yeah. explain what happened there? So first of all, you have to realize that the cables were published in, uh, uh, the Wikileaks pub started publishing the first cables in the 28th of November, 2010. And initially they published in, uh, uh, with media partners, redacting each by each the cables. And uh, the process was very lengthy, was difficult, and uh, we have worked for so many months on this process. In 2011, in September 2011, the cables were finally released without any reduction. Why? Wikileaks have never wanted this, never, ever. And we are witness of this because we were there. We know how many hours spent reading these cables, redacting names, and so on. This was never intended that the, the cables would be published without any redaction with the names available to everyone. So what happened? Uh, the publications of uh, the publication of unredacted cables is the result of many steps by many different actors. And Julian Assange and Wikileaks had no control of these actors because it was the result of uh, some supporters publishing the encrypted database online in mirrors and website in order to avoid censorship of Wikileaks publication. It was the result of the, of the Guardian publishing the, the password for this for this encrypted that. database. And to the best of my knowledge, no other media partners published the password. And we were told all the time not to publish passwords. We were explained this by WikiLeaks, by Julian Assange in person. So I don't know why the Guardian published the password. But even if the Guardian had published the password, you know, it's a... Uh, uh, what, what made people connecting the dots was when the German uh, weekly, Der Freitag, published a story telling the public that the documents were available online in an encrypted form and the password were, was also available, publicly available. At that time, everyone who had was able to connect the dots knew that it was possible to decrypt the documents and to reveal them. And in fact, Krypton by John Young, the famous website by John Young, published them before Wikileaks, published the cables using that password published by 
by The Guardian and using the archive, which was available online to everyone in an encrypted form. So basically all these actions by people on, on, with, on whom Julian Assange had no control, they had no control on, on the garden publishing the password or the supporter publishing, supporters publishing the encrypted archive and so on. All these factors resulted in the publication of unredacted cables. But it is not Julian Assange's responsibility. And indeed, I witness all attempts by Julian Assange to to get the cooperation of the US State Department. They call him. I was in Ellingham Hall when while he was, he was under house arrest. Yes, he was under house arrest in this <clears throat> beautiful countryside house in the countryside. And he was trying to call the uh, State Department to, to get their assistance. Clearly, they had no interest in assisting them, <laughs> no interest whatsoever why they didn't want to cooperate with Julian Assange. They could have, I mean, they had cooperated with the New York Times. They assisted the New York Times to redact their cables. So why not to cooperate with the New York Times? And you have to realize that during my litigation, FOI litigation, in this case, in the US against the State Department, I was able to get very, very few documents, but at least two of them, are about uh, the com confidential meetings between the US authorities and the Guardian and the New York Times. There are two letters. One letter is from Julian Assange to the US authorities asking, could you please provide the names which you think we should redact? And the US authorities told them, we are not interested, we will, we will not cooperate with you. Uh, you have to immediately uh, um, you have to immediately erase any document you have and to <clears throat> give us back the documentation. While they were treating Julian Assange and WikiLeaks in these ways, they were fully cooperating with The Guardian, with The New York Times, with the other media. Why they had this double standard? Why <laughs> they provide the full assistance to the mainstream media, to The New York Times and the other mainstream media, and they refuse any cooperation with uh, Julian Assange which WikiLeaks, which were asking for assistance in redacting cables. So they had a responsible approach. They were trying to get their collaboration. You know, why they, when they met the Guardian, the US authorities met the Guardian before the publication of cables. And I got these documents of their confidential uh, meeting. I got it through relentless litigation against the State Department. Why they, when they met the Guardian, they never asked, uh, you should stop publishing these documents, you should uh, give us back the documentation. They never asked for this, they never ever. They had a relaxed conversation, whereas the full, the full fury was with Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, and they tried hard to get their cooperation. They called them, they wrote them, and there was no cooperation whatsoever. So why they did it? Because they maybe didn't want to cooperate in order to be able to charge him, mm. or maybe because they hope there would be some collateral damage, someone exactly. dead, you know? And so that they could say, oh, they have blood in their hands, you know? Exactly. That's what I was thinking. Like, maybe they actually wanted it, I mean, to turn out that way, that they were but just fine sacrificing. Yeah. These are well, legitimate questions. Right. You, you read their correspondence, you ask yourself why they are cooperating with the New York Times or The Guardian. They are not with uh, WikiLeaks. I mean, right. there's no, ras no, no rational explanation, right. you know? And there's that audio of Assange reaching out to them. You hear him on the phone with the State Department people trying to- I got to... the copy. I got the copy because I didn't want to rely on the Assange defense. I think sure. a journalist has to acquire right. documentation independently from, from WikiLeaks. So I got a copy of the, of the transcript of that call. So, I mean, it's uh, indisputable that that sure. call had not been manipulated and so on, you know? Right, right.
Well, any final words about Asandra WikiLeaks? This has been so great. And I so thank you so much for your time. It's been such a great interview. Well, I, I, as I said, I, I would like to call on people to mobilize because, you know, people can do a lot for him. If people, uh, you know, uh, try to act, try to um, agitate, <laughs> try to mobilize, I believe this case can still be won. won. Maybe it's not easy to win it, but we, I think it's, there are still room for winning it. So it is a matter of public pressure. This is why, for example, the uh, Argentinian Peace Nobel um, Prize, uh, Esquivel, uh, is basically trying to mobilize in intellectual journalists, uh, celebrities, because he remembered his own case. He was targeted by the Argentinian regime. And the only reason why he survived is uh, people mobilizing and trying to stop his uh, killing, basically. And it worked in his case. So can if it worked with the Argentinian dictatorship, I'm sure there is room for, the, for this case as well. And unless people give up, we still can fight for it. Thank you so much for coming. We're going to do a call in. Please make sure that you like the stream. Please subscribe to the stream. Please join the YouTube, um, become Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Phantom Asfanto, for the clips. And um, uh, I think that's about it. Just thank you so much for coming on the show. And we will see you next week. Okay, come down. Wait, wait, wait.